Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. This is a webinar in the ser series in relation to borderline personality disorder towards the National Borderline Personality Disorder Training and Professional Development Strategy and it's brought to you by Borderline um, Personality Disorder Foundation Spectrum and MHPN. So hopefully you've, you've been part of our um, earlier webinar um, that happened earlier on but um, if not, welcome to, to this one and this is webinar two titled Treatment Principles Borderline Personality Disorder. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. And I know there's lots of people, we've got over a thousand people who are joining us so far and you'll be all around the country. We wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and future, to the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. I'm Blyn O'Grady and I'll be facilitating this evening's session and I'm joined by a panel who I'll introduce shortly. I work, um, do some of these webinars for MHPN on a regular basis and will enjoy the opportunity to, to learn along, along with you. And in my normal day job, I work at the Australian Psychological Society and manager, manager of strategic projects there and, and also do some supervision of some psychology interns as well. So I'm really interested, um, like you are, in, in this Topic. Um, as I said, this is the second of the series of webinars funded by the Australian Government. And if you didn't attend the first webinar, which was called What is Borderline Personality Disorder, which is a good title for a first webinar, you can go onto the MHPN web website and you'll be able to find it there. And um, that, that webinar was a really good introduction. But tonight we'll, we'll pick up on, on that but also extend. And we also have some other webinars that will be coming up as well as part of this series. And there they are. So you can see there that um, there's a lot to cover and tonight we'll be touching on, on some aspects of treatment but more around principles and the next one will pick up much more detail around evidence-based treatments and access. And then webinar four will have a particular focus on young people and early intervention. Webinar five, self-injury and suicidality. Webinar six, management in mental health services, primary and private sectors. So we may touch on some of those tonight, but we're really going to hold off on the main focus and, and really focus on those in, in coming webinars and really talk about treatment principles tonight. So a bit of a reminder also that when we ever we do these webinars, just to, um, I guess, remind people to think about your own self-care. We, we're very aware that it's late in the day. People might be watching this later as a podcast as well. But in the evening, you really sort of thinking about this, this particular topic and thinking about your own experiences or, or um, concerns you may have with clients. So just, just be, I guess, prepared for the conversations that we're going to have and the information you will be receiving and, and just be monitoring your own self-care in, in terms of what it is that you need to do to look after yourself. This is obviously a professional development event. We're not going to be sort of touching into clients or, or specific details around around people but really wanting you to um, be mindful of, um, of yourselves and looking after yourself as well. All right, you were given the um, bios of the panellists, so we're not going to go through them in, in detail, but you can you can see here that we've got, as always with MHPN um, panels, we have a, a mixed group of people so that we can actually bring together some different perspectives and some different different ways that, that people are working, but really towards how do we work together, how do we we gain from, from hearing from different professionals, and of course, Having a, a consumer as part of the panel is always something that I know people really appreciate and, and again keeps us um, all very focused and, and really thinking about what that might mean. So I really appreciate that as well. So let's introduce um, the panel and, and get them um, talking with you as that's who you really, you're here to, to listen to. So let's begin with you, Safia. And um, Safia <coughs> is Associate Professor Safia Rayo and he's a psychiatrist. And Sathy, you've had a strong interest in borderline personality disorder for quite a long time. What is it that, that where did that begin or how come? Look, uh, the, the, the basic fact is that I actually uh, enjoy working with uh, people with uh, borderline personality disorder. Once you get to know them, uh, they are some of the nicest, kindest and thoughtful people you can meet. They're also extremely forgiving of me, and that they're very compassionate. Uh, they forgive all my shortcomings, uh, you know, running late or you know, annoyingly offending them. 
and uh, they get done all the time and uh, the work is highly rewarding and i have immense job satisfaction yeah fantastic that's great it's always nice when people are very forgiving of of our own faults isn't it that's really helpful absolutely, for us absolutely absolutely well. <laughs> thanks sathya Teresa, let's let's to introduce you. So you're, you're a psychologist and you have particular interest in, in this area and you were one of the authors of the NHMRC and I'm not going to go through the acronym, we're going to be talking about that tonight but it's best practice guidelines and how do you think that these can be helpful for practitioners? What, what, how do they help people? Well they're very helpful and given as a, a direction and a guide for all practitioners involved in trying to raise awareness and get intervention for this population. Particularly um, what's useful is the management, combined management plans, um, especially ED where a consumer, a client and a clinician all have input and it can pre be presented and useful to all across the board um, to, to, to know how to work best and how to manage. The guidelines are just that, they're fantastic and they're the first Australian guidelines that, we've been, that have been written. So I think they're really good, a best place to start. Yeah, fantastic. I, I downloaded them and had a had a look at them and, and fabulous as a resource. Okay, welcome back to our webinar. We've had a little bit of um, technological um, issues back here where um, my phone dropped out basically and then needed to, to get back in. So we uh, apologise for that and hopefully we'll be, we'll be okay from, from now on. So I think where we left you was um, we just finished talking with Teresa, is that, is that right? And about to introduce Aaron. So we've been talking about those guidelines and how fabulous they are and that we um, want everyone to have a look at them later on that we'll be using them to, to talk through tonight. So Aaron, let's, um, let's introduce you and keep moving while we can. So Aaron, welcome oh, and you're still here you. which is good. <laughs> Glad yeah. we've still got you. Um, so you're a yeah. consumer advocate. How long have you been doing this kind of advocacy work for, in relation to borderline personality disorder? Um, I've been doing advocacy work since about October last year when I attended a, a coronial inquest into the two deaths of um, some girls that were diagnosed with BPD. So I met with the BPD Foundation who attended that inquest as well and um, they invited me along to uh, give a panel discussion at a movie night for a film called Borderline and I answered a bunch of audience questions and I sort of just hit it off from there in, in doing various works and advocacy. Okay, yeah, I've, I was diagnosed in 1995 with BPD, um, a bit of a rocky road but I now work full time for the government. I'm also studying a Bachelor of Laws at Flinders University here in South Australia. Yeah, fantastic. Working and studying is huge. So thank you. It is a big load. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so thanks very much for joining us and as I said earlier, it's really important that we have your, your perspective here and really appreciate you you've been here and joining us and it makes it much more holistic when we're hearing from, from a whole range of people and certainly this experience is, is critical to, to informing our work. So thank you very much. You're All welcome. right, I think I've got a slide in a moment about um, technology, <laughs> funnily enough. This is sort of our ground rules which I touched on earlier. So this is um, of course making sure we all get as much as, much as we can out of, of the webinar. So being respectful to, to participants and panellists, we have question and answer this time, we don't have the chat. So people who are familiar with MHP and webinars would, would be maybe looking for the chat. We have question and answer because we've got so many people joining us, we, um, we just find it's a bit tricky to manage the chat in, in such, such a big audience. So it's, it's question and answer, you will have a chance to, to ask some questions. But we also had heaps of questions that came through through the registration process. So we've got lots of, we know lots of questions people are really interested in. If you do have any technical issues, <laughs> it's a bit ironic saying this now, there's a help desk who are very helpful because you can see they can get us back online again <laughs> if, our, if our sound goes. So if there's any concerns that you do have, there's the 1800 number there that you can, um, you can call in on and they'll do their very best to, to keep us all functioning very well. All right, let me see what else we need to be talking about. The format tonight is also a little bit different. We're sort of throwing all the rules out tonight. We normally with um, MHPN and, and last time with the Borderline Personality Disorders um, webinar number one, we have <coughs> to have a case study. 
and it's usually that case study that we sort of focus on. But tonight we're, we're not going to go with the case study. We're going to have the presenters talking through, going, going and having their presentations and then the question and answer at the end as we normally do. Um, but there's no, no particular case that we're going to be looking at. So as always we have some learning outcomes that we're working towards. So the first one of those is identifying core treatment strategies for BPD describing the application of treatment principles included in the, that's what that acronym stands for, National Health and Medical Research Council Clinical Practice Guidelines, so that was what um, Teresa was talking about before. And we're going to identify how to be therapeutic even when not undertaking formal psychotherapy. So this is a really important message I think that, that we're going to be to sending tonight. So this is relevant to every practitioner, so that's, that, that's the message, that's really what um, what we're going to be focused on um, tonight. So let's move into our panellist presentations and we're going to begin with you, Safia. So over to you. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, let me start uh, uh, saying that uh, borderline personality disorder uh, is a very common uh, mental illness impacting at least 1% of the Australian population. It impacts both men and women equally. Uh, however, in clinical populations, women are overrepresented. Uh, men, unfortunately, uh, uh, we see them in uh, drug and alcohol clinics or in uh, uh, justice and uh, correction systems. We, to date, we don't have uh, any medications uh, that work for borderline personality disorder uh, that is patented or indicated specifically for BPD. However, medications are used commonly and uh, they can take the edge off some of the uh, symptoms. So BPD can clearly be treated and the treatment of choice is psychological treatment. The treatments that are uh, popular and that are uh, quite well known to clinicians are the specialist treatments uh, such as uh, dialectical behavior therapy or uh, mentalization based therapy, etc. So these uh, uh, treatments are uh, unfortunately very expensive and uh, it requires extensive training uh, in order to provide treatment. Uh, and as you can imagine, the uh, vast majority of clinicians are may not trained to provide uh, either DBT or MBT or those sort of uh, highly specialized uh, treatments. As a result, uh, most patients with BPD go untreated. It is seen as uh, uh, all or none, uh, either highly specialized uh, expert, uh, sp uh, expensive treatment such as uh, DBT is given or nothing is offered at all. And also it is very wrongly believed that uh, uh, only a few highly trained psychotherapists can provide uh, treatment for uh, bodily personality disorder. Uh, latest research shows that uh, treatment principles uh, can be learned by clinicians uh, without putting themselves through uh, very ex ex uh, extensive and expensive uh, training programs and still make uh, quite a difference uh, to the patient uh, outcome. Now, we have uh, uh, the national guidelines, as Lynn was pointing out uh, earlier on, and these guidelines uh, outline uh, treatment principles that most clinicians can apply uh, in their clinical settings to help people with uh, borderline personality disorder uh, get better. The specialist treatments such as uh, DBT or MBT are certainly useful uh, and effective and may be required uh, for a small number of uh, patients. Uh, but not every single uh, person with BPD uh, requires uh, specialized treatment such as uh, DBT or MBT. So uh, BPD, I believe, uh, is a disorder every clinician uh, can contribute to the recovery journey of uh, uh, people who are experiencing BPD and uh, they can become aware of uh, the treatment principles and learn those treatment principles and use it in every single clinical interaction. So BPD is uh, every uh, clinician's business and everyone can uh, clearly contribute to the medical Thank you. Right. Th thanks very much, Safiya. 
I think, a really important um, setting the scene for tonight's webinar. So perhaps people are thinking that I don't have the skills or I don't have the specialist training. And I guess the really important point is that it's something that everybody can play a role in and that not all um, clients might need that, that level of expertise. So when we're doing that though, I guess the point of tonight is that we're really looking at, well, what are the principles? What do you do and what's the most important part of that work? So this is where we're going to hand across now to Teresa and start to have a look at breaking down some of these principles. And what is it that, that we would want people to be doing? Now it looks like Teresa's screen is not working, so we've got some gremlins in our system tonight, but we can hear okay. you, Teresa. Okay. So, so as I said, just this picture for me epitomizes compassionate therapeutic understanding because when working with clients with a borderline personality disorder, this picture is helpful because our shared commonality as human beings is that we all come into this world as innocent, dependent infant, infants. However, influences with our hereditary, our environment, or lack of humanistic nature and nurture, perhaps trauma, shape the adolescent or the adult that presents in treatment before you. So um, the other one is like building, what's important when working with clients is building a solid therapeutic foundation and trust the regering way. So this is imperative. A strong therapeutic alliance can make a difference to the clients and also to good therapeutic outcomes. So being warm, empathic, authentic, non-judgmental and having positive regard for clients are the hallmarks for laying the foundation of, of the house for future work. Also being truthful. I tell my clients how I'm going to work from the start. I inform them of my personal boundaries, what's safe for me, therefore that makes it safe for them. Um, and I'll sometimes refer to them in the third person. I'll say, I, you have to take good care of my client or I'm entrusting my client into your care. So the other thing that I find useful pictorially is Cartman's Triangle in pers Persecutor, Rescuer and Victim. So um, this, this one is very useful because we have to build a strong therapeutic alliance and if you tell them how you work from the outset, this triangle can be very helpful because if you find yourself in this triangle as a therapist, then your challenge is to get off it. So to maintain your therapeutic uh, neutrality. So I always give a note to myself that a rescuer therapist needs a compliant victim to rescue. So we are in the business of empowering our clients and teaching them skills to be their own rescuer. So let the client rescue them themselves. If you want to be useful, get off the triangle because eventually you'll either be the persecutor, you'll be the victim, or you'll be the rescuer. So for your therapeutic boundaries, make sure you stay off. Transference and counter-transference are the central challenges that are involved in psychotherapy for dealing with clients um, with BPD. We're always under pr pressure to transgress our therapeutic boundaries. Um, and again, the triangle can be very useful for this. Um, yeah. The, the things that can engender in us that with transference and counter-transference, it can evoke strong emotions. So anger and rage, anxiety, a feeling of hopelessness, sadness, feeling overwhelmed, love and compassion, irritation, and of being stuck. That's what can happen um, as some of the transference and counter-transference. So Whilst we have to acknowledge where we're at with, uh, under good supervision, et cetera, um, transference and counter-transference, we have to set the boundaries and just let them know, let our clients know from the outset how we work, what way we work, what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. So we have to make sure that our own immediate physical needs are met. We have to also remind ourselves that we are the caring professional in relation to our client. We have to be very cautious with our self-disclosure. Self-disclosure is only useful when it's about the client. And I explained this from the beginning when we jointly develop our shared framework. If I make it about me, I tell my client, then it's not about you. And my client deserves a full 50 minutes of my undivided attention as they've been ignored long enough. So this session has to be about you and less about me. 
When it comes to validation, validation is very important, even from one session in the emergency department or one or two th or sessions, validation is imperative. So the essence of validation is the therapist communicates to a client that his or her responses make sense and are very understandable within his or her current life context or, or, or situation. So the secret to effective validation is knowing when to use it and knowing when not to. Um, and once it's begun, when you should cut it off. So be a cheerleader, be a coach, encourage, focus on strength and acknowledge positively and reinforce the client for when they use their wise mind over their emotional mind. So validation, up the validation when sensitive topics are being addressed. Increase it then. Even within a particular session, the need for the therapist um, validation can be expected to vary. Stick with the, their emotions. Um, and therapy with a borderline client can almost be likened to pushing an individual ever closer to the edge of a sheer cliff. Just remember that the client is doing the best that they can. Validate and acknowledge you're doing the very best that you can. So. It's over to Safia. Yes, back, back to me. So thank you very much, Teresa. There was a lot of information contained in, in those slides and, and you went through it. I'm sure people are, are taking in pieces of that. There was certainly lots of talk around the importance of boundaries, the importance of being up very clear and upfront at, at the start. And I'm glad that you had that triangle there because I could see a question had come in about that. So the rescuer, victim, persecutor. Um, somebody asked, how do you get out of it? Well, you said, don't get on it. So okay. that was that was very, very timely. So thank you very much for that. We'll continue to unpack these principles as, as we go through. So let's go back to you again, Safia, to, to talk about them a little bit more and go a little bit deeper, perhaps. I think you'll have to unmute yourself, Safia. We can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Um, in the next few minutes, I'll uh, try and highlight some of the most important uh, treatment principles uh, that are highlighted in the NHMRC uh, 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 treatment guidelines. Now, the most important principle is that to believe that BPD is a legitimate mental illness deserving treatment. It is not just a behavior. It is clearly a disorder of the brain and the mind. Uh, as my uh, colleague Teresa was saying, it's very important to take a validating and non-judgmental uh, treatment approach. Uh, the research shows that uh, when clinicians are active, uh, engaging, enthusiastic, willing, and uh, wanting to actually work with uh, people with borderline personality disorder, then the clinical outcomes are better uh, with those clinicians. So it's also important to keep the therapeutic relationship light and, uh, uh, and uh, alive, and uh, and I tend to uh, keep myself just as I am. Uh, that's probably the best bet. We also uh, want to uh, educate uh, patients, uh, their families, carers, partners, uh, etc., about uh, the symptoms, causes, uh, treatment, and prognosis. See, I'm sure all of us would know that uh, uh, we want to educate our patients about uh, any illness. Uh, any patient needs to be uh, uh, educated about any illness. However, uh, it's particularly important when it comes to bodily personality disorder because there is so much of misinformation out there. Uh, often, uh, they have received misinformation, uh, wrong information, and uh, they are they're often confused. Uh, Patients can blame themselves uh, for symptoms. Families can blame themselves uh, for some of the symptoms. So uh, it's very important to explain what is borderline personality disorder and have a good discussion. Also, it is important to uh, highlight the fact that uh, the science of borderline personality disorder is only about 15, 20 years old. So therefore, uh, it can be quite challenging to access uh, evidence-based and uh, proper uh, treatments. It is uh, one of the important principles is to develop a treatment and a crisis plan. Uh, that is, 
developed jointly and uh, collaboratively uh, with patients. Uh, this again is very important uh, because uh, it is it can be difficult for uh, people with borderline personality disorder to uh, place the trust uh, in the clinicians and let the clinicians uh, guide the treatment and take over the treatment because uh, they may have had uh, experience in the uh, experiences in the past which have uh, not particularly been uh, very helpful. So they might find it hard to place the trust. So in our practice uh, at Spectra, we tend to uh, get our patients to co-author uh, the treatment plan. In fact, we give them the template and get them to fill it up, and we have you know, several negotiations, and finally we reach a treatment plan and a crisis plan that all of us uh, uh, own. It is also important to... Uh, uh, have uh, clearly agreed upon uh, goals for uh, treatment, and the treatment should be focused on achieving real change. Because validation uh, and acceptance uh, of the situation, of the trauma, of the past is very important, but so is uh, uh, trying to work on uh, change. As uh, my colleague Teresa was uh, pointing out, it's uh, extremely important to uh, attend to emotions. People with borderline personality disorder uh, experience uh, significant and severe emotions, and clinicians who are working with them can also experience emotional reactions. So, therefore, to be aware of the emotions uh, that are occurring in the therapeutic uh, context uh, becomes vital. It is also encouraged uh, to bring in uh, self-reflection. Uh, I believe self-reflection should happen both uh, uh, for patients as well as clinicians. Clinicians should encourage patients and stimulate uh, self-reflection in uh, uh, patients. And also clinicians, while working with people with borderline personality disorder, needs to constantly keep reflecting on their own thought process, their own emotions, and their own behaviors. And... Uh, then that if patients are self-harming, uh, self-injuring, and it is important not to assume that uh, they are self-they are self-injuring uh, just to gain attention. Uh, it is, uh, I think, it is important to just ask the patients uh, why they self-injure. The most common reason why patients uh, tend to self-injure is because they are trying to regulate their most painful uh, emotions. Often. Uh, uh, patients with borderline personality disorder may not be able to uh, connect their emotions with their uh, behaviors and their thought processes. So it's the clinician's role to help them make the connections between emotions, thoughts, and behaviors, and teach the necessary uh, skills to regulate emotions and uh, navigate uh, relationships. Uh, People with borderline personality disorder may have experienced uh, suicidal feelings and thoughts for years and years and years. So therefore, uh, it is not going to be possible to change the suicidal thoughts immediately. What uh, seems to bring about the change in the suicidal thoughts is if their uh, quality of life improves and their emotions and lives become uh, less painful. So therefore, it is very important to uh, work on uh, improving the uh, quality of uh, life. If the suicidal urges are uh, severe, and if the clinicians uh, feel that uh, the, there is a danger, then of course it is very important to uh, provide uh, intense uh, supports, uh, which might include hospitalization for uh, brief periods of time. As I was uh, uh, telling you in the uh, introduction, we still don't have any medications that are patented or indicated for treatment of uh, borderline personality disorder. However, uh, almost every uh, person with a borderline personality disorder does get prescribed with uh, medications. Uh, the medications can take the edge of some of the symptoms, and the consensus uh, is that uh, about 20% of the intensity of the symptoms can be reduced by using medications. So, but the use of medications can play a role, but what is important to remember is that medications 
should not be used as a sole treatment for uh, body and brain disorder. Uh, also, we know uh, uh, from a report that uh, about 25% of the uh, people, patients with borderline personality disorder, attempt suicide uh, with uh, prescribed medication. Therefore, clinicians have to be extremely uh, careful when prescribing the medications. Having said that, uh, there is a clear role for medications for coexisting uh, psychiatric disorders such as depression, uh, psychosis, etc. Uh, another treatment principle is to be uh, mindful and take a very here and now approach uh, to the problems. Looking at backwards, uh, uh, looking at the trauma, looking at the childhood and developmental uh, issues is important, uh, very important, and that needs to be validated, understood. Uh, however, in the initial phase of the treatment, uh, we would not recommend a trauma-focused uh, treatment. Trauma-focused treatments can come in later on, uh, in later stages, uh, if patients uh, are wanting to discuss the trauma and when they are a little more uh, settled. And the trauma-focused treatments are uh, best undertaken by uh, clinicians and psychotherapists who have expertise in dealing with uh, those sort of issues. It is also uh, essential for clinicians to take a long-term view of the treatment. In the short term, uh, there can be ups and downs, uh, symptoms can exacerbate and limit. Uh, however, in the long term, uh, we know that uh, most patients uh, get better. Another principle I would want to highlight is that uh, we clinicians need to advocate strongly uh, for the welfare of uh, people with borderline personality disorder because they often refused uh, access to uh, services and evidence-based treatments. Uh, the common experience uh, for several borderline personality disorder patients is that when they go to emergency departments, they don't get the appropriate care. When they go to, when they try and access uh, CAT teams, they don't get the appropriate care. Or uh, even in uh, situations such as you know, when they're they trying to access uh, emergency services, sometimes or they, they present themselves in family court settings. So it's very important for uh, clinicians to advocate uh, for uh, the well-being of uh, people with borderline personality disorder. I'll probably stop here and uh, yeah. hand over to my colleague. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Safia. And again, there's so much to cover in this webinar. You've, you've touched a little bit there on some treatments. I'm just a reminder that we'll be picking up on that in the, in the next webinar. So we'll be really really focusing on that because I'm sure people will be will be really interested in that. You also um, touched on another question that came through was around how do we support schools and families. You touched on that, the importance of, of psychoeducation, I guess, and that there's a lot that we don't, that people don't know. So helping people to understand the disorder is a really important part of that. So again, we'll, we'll continue that, that discussion. I am really keen to move on to you now, Aaron. You've been waiting very patiently, and, and this is the perspective that, that is really important for us. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I will be discussing what works with BAPD consumers and what to avoid in interactions, both long-term and once-off interactions. So things to remember with consumers. Um, when dealing with threats of suicide, hospital is often the first port of call. By detaining and sending a person with BPD to hospital, some clinicians reinforce poor coping mechanisms inadvertently. If a presentation results in the revocation of a detention order, care needs to be taken in explaining the reasons for revoking the detention order. Simply stating to a consumer, you don't have a mental illness, is unhelpful and serious issues may arise um, escalating uh, those sorts of behaviours. Medication should always be used as a last resort. Sometimes BPD behaviour can become aggressive and medication should be used as a once-off to diffuse tense situations when all other avenues such as talking, distraction or reasoning do not work. Validation is not enough. While validation works in assisting a consumer with BPD that a clinician can empathise or sympathise with their feelings, there is an opportunity for a clinician to discuss alternative strategies for coping with feelings and or replacing behaviours with strategies that work. Sometimes it helps to re-emphasise feelings past and do not hang around forever. 
DBT, MBT and schema therapy may be beneficial, however not one treatment works for all and it is helpful to be honest with a consumer about variations of responses to treatment. So a clinician should try to avoid projecting their own feelings onto a consumer with BPD. This is because projecting a clinician's own issues onto a consumer can frustrate a relationship unintentionally. Try not to overanalyze your own responses and identify when you are stressed, overworked or frustrated. Honesty can go a long way with a person with BPD and do not be afraid to discuss yourselves. Some of the best interactions I had with mental health staff was when they were frank and honest but not dismissive of my feelings. That's really important. Rescuing consumers with BPD should be avoided as this may reinforce a consumer's own BPD behaviour. Such rescue attempts may delay a person with BPD from engaging in helpful ways to overcome difficulties. Rescuing behaviours from a clinical perspective may also cause burnout and focusing all your time and energy on a consumer beyond normal boundaries of human interaction. Validation can help an opportunity to reinforce different methods of coping with intense feelings and emotions when replaced with healthy coping mechanisms. One of the best analogies that was put forward to myself was by my mother. A certain person I was having issues with at the time was that this person didn't hate me, they disliked my behaviour. Separate the difference between a person being able to dislike behaviour rather than disliking the BPD consumer as an entire person. That analogy can be very helpful and I can attest to this sentence by my mother changing my life. Being supportive is mainly advised from a psychological perspective. Re-emphasise that receiving a diagnosis of BPD does not make he or she a bad person. Advise that having BPD is difficult but can be overcome with persistence. Consumers may have intensely bad days but ultimately they are responsible for their own behaviour. I personally took five to six times at various stages to realise harmful behaviours were not helping with anything and sometimes it took longer to change them. Avoid bad language and loud conversations about BPD behaviours in front of a consumer, especially if it's about them. Consumers may escalate poor behaviours as a result of overhearing a conversation between clinical staff. This is not manipulative. The reaction is more likely a result of their intense feelings being hurt. Imagine if I spoke of a poor behaviour over a loudspeaker in a shopping mall. Would you react well? Behaviour from, from a clinician should replicate what is expected from a consumer. Whilst many BPD consumers can be sarcastic, taking the approach of replying with sarcasm is inappropriate. Often consumers have little insight into how their language and behaviour affects others and need to be taught the ways in which their behaviour affects others. Condescending language and using the term crazy can antagonise a consumer. Try to avoid these terms manipulative and attention seeking. These terms do nothing but reinforce at how poor BPD is misunderstood. And just lastly, BPD consumers are human. They have thoughts and feelings like everyone. Most often in one-off scenarios, consumers are brought in by police or ambulance in a hospital environment and are highly agitated because of potential adverse commentary received by these services. Stating what's your problem will only work to frustrate a person with BPD as they've probably just received an interrogation from police or ambulance prior. Be tactful with how you ask what is wrong. BPD is tiring, exhausting and frustrating not just for clinicians but for the consumers themselves. Most one-off interactions with BPD consumers can present with the worst scenarios and problems. A good analogy is to liken a person with problematic escalated BPD behaviours as, burns, as a burns victim. You wouldn't withhold pain medication from a burn victim so why would you with emotional pain? And that concludes my presentation for treatment strategies for consumers with BPD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Again, lots of information and food for thought, I think, in, in terms of um, your perspective and, and a real honesty in terms of what it's, what it's like, but a, a real awareness as well of what it's like for practitioners, so the frustrations that a um, person with borderline might be experiencing, but also some of the challenges. So thank you very much for that. I think it's really important to, for us all to, to be thinking about that and to, to hear that in, in such a, an open way. 
We're up to our Q&A now, so I can see there's lots and lots of questions coming through. A lot of them are treatment focused, so that will be next webinar. So this keeps you coming back, so that you have to come next time for, for treatment specific ones. And I think that um, some of the questions that we're, we're planning to um, ask you will pick up on some of, some of the questions that are coming through as well. So certainly some of the, the questions are around the public mental health system and how, the, how that works. We've got, we're going to, to look at that. And another question, and I think we'll kick this off with you, Safia, one of the questions was, was really around how do, we, how do we kind of do this, how do we know about this when specialist treatment might be required. So we know that specialist evidence-based psychological treatment such as DBT, not everybody is trained in that. So it does mean that, that not all patients are able to access those, those treatments. But with our argument tonight is that there are um, lots that every clinician who's working with a person with borderline personality disorder can contribute to as part of the treatment planning, even if they're not able to access um, specialist evidence-based long-term treatment planning. So. Are you able to talk a little bit more about that and perhaps around, I did see one question that was around where, how do we know that? You know, this is still, you said 20 years I think we've been researching and understanding this. So how, do we, how can we feel confident that what people are doing is going to be helpful if they're not a specialist, I guess? So broad, a couple of questions there. Okay. Um, I'll answer the uh, last question first. Uh, what we know is that uh, uh, we have done what are called dismantling studies. We have compared uh, specialist treatments such as uh, DBT, MBT, and other uh, treatments. And what we find is that they are all equally effective. Uh, none comes out as superior to the other. We also looked at uh, genderless treatments, genderless treatments meaning treatments using common factors or treatments using the treatment principles uh, that we outlined today. So if we do treatments using, psychological treatments using treatment principles, or whether we, if we use treatments using uh, DBT or MBT, they are equally effective. So research shows that if you work with people with borderline personality disorder using treatment principles, what we call it in science as common factors, they are as effective as DBT. So therefore, you can be confident that you can treat people with borderline personality disorder using common factors treatment, the treatment principles, and that that, that it will work. And that's what uh, uh, research shows. And uh, we at Spectrum do use uh, treatment principles, and uh, we find the outcomes are quite good. So I'll try and explain what uh, uh, summarize what those uh, what the treatment looks like, uh, probably with an analogy. Let's, uh, we know that uh, when people uh, have borderline personality disorder, they experience intense emotions. Let's compare that to a car, uh, no disrespect meant, let's compare that to a car with very, very sensitive accelerators. And normally what would happen when, people, when we have uh, intense emotions is our, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the thinking brain, the, the, uh, the prefrontal cortex, uh, would bring in the regulations, uh, regulatory mechanisms, and control the emotions. So those regulatory uh, mechanisms, let's compare that to the, the brakes of the car. It is as though people with borderline personality disorder are driving cars in their lives that has very sensitive accelerators and very poor brakes. Uh, outwardly, uh, everything looks all right. So if we see someone uh, driving very erratically, we tend to judge them as poor drivers. Uh, if only we knew that uh, they have very, very sensitive accelerators and very poor brakes, then we are not going to be judgmental. The task here for clinicians is to sit in that car, share some of the risks alongside patients, and teach the patients how to drive such a car. What we know in science is that once uh, you, can, you teach them, once they learn the skills, they are actually able to drive that car uh, quite all right and they don't uh, end up in crashes, and they don't, you know, their driving is not erratic. So the, 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 the principle here is that the problem is in the car, uh, not with the driver. So problem is in the, uh, the brains, uh, uh, and the regulatory mechanisms, and the emotional uh, uh, brains of people with borderline personality disorder, and it is not the person who is at fault. It is not the patient who is at fault. And if any one of us were to drive such a car, we would also drive very radically. 
So uh, the idea is to keep teaching the person how to negotiate through relationships, uh, work, uh, emotions, and all the other skills that they require. I wonder whether that sort of sums up uh, what the uh, treatment principles are. Thanks, Sethi. I think that does. And I, I know the website, and I'll give people the link later at the end, there's a website that does have those common factors. And so that's, that's kind of the research that you're talking about there, that the research that tells us that it's the relationship, that the therapeutic relationship that we develop with clients that, that makes a big difference. I really like that car analogy. It reminded me when I was teaching my daughter to drive and one day the car did have a, have a fault and, and um, just sort of stopped in the middle of traffic and we had to, I really had to step into the shoes as the, as the person with her when she was driving and really, really think about what does she need to do, what's going on with this vehicle. So I think that's a really nice image for us to carry and to be able to think about well, what does that mean and what is it that we need to, to help and teach and guide people to think about in order to manage this situation that they're, that they're in. Yeah. So thank you, I think that's really helpful. Let's ask another question. We've, we're going to go over a little bit tonight because we had our little technical hitch. So we'll, we'll have an extra five minutes or so because it is important that we get, get a chance to, to hear from, from panellists a little bit more in, in some of the details that people are interested in. So Teresa, I've got a question for you now which is picking up on that, that public and private practice setting. So one of the questions was, is anyone working in the public system and know about this 10 session business that, um, that people get. So the question that I, I'm going to place to you is how can psychologists or other mental health professionals work with people with borderline personality disorder if you can only see the patients for 10 times a year? Well, John F. Kennedy once said, do something. It's been my experience that working with students on practicum or working with the novice therapist, they make the best therapist because assessment requires that the therapist along with the client constantly, constantly look for what is missing from the individual or personal explanations of current behaviours and events. So the question always being asked is, what, if, what are we leaving out here? What are we not getting? So as mentioned throughout this presentation, and Safia mentioned that a here and now approach, validation to the client regarding their lived experience, be upfront and collaborative in what their expectations are for engaging with therapy for, with you. Don't, don't, um, don't, don't promise what you can't deliver. Focus on the assessment, what's happening here and now, including any current risk to self. Psychoeducation around neuro neurobiological factors contributing to emotional dysregulation, to impulsivity, and how currently their lack of distress tolerance um, is impinging on what's going on for them just now. So sometimes showing clients a visual map of the brain and highlighting that currently the nine functions of your prefrontal cortex appear to be shut down in shutdown mode. Over the next few sessions, you and I need to work together to help you take control of this little part of your brain. This just means that just now, your feeling brain is overriding your thinking brain. So teach them mindfulness techniques here and now and how to engage and ground in the senses. So just, you know, anything that you can do that is evidence-based and therapeutic can be done in three sessions, can be done in five sessions, can be done in ten. John F. Kennedy, as I reiterate, says, do something. Don't be afraid. You can do something. You can join. You can be empathic. You can educate. You can develop a relationship in those 10 hours. It might be the best 10 hours that that client ever, ever had. Fantastic. Thanks. I really like that, that end point, that, that 10 hours might be the best they had. If you're following these treatment principles and people um, develop that trusting relationship and that psychoeducation, understanding what's happening, sounds like it's a really important part of the work. So there's a lot that you can cover in, in 10 sessions. So thanks for that perspective, Teresa. I think that's really important and hopefully does um, give people a sense that what you, what you can do in that, that period of time can be really helpful. And it's, it's part of that, that um, the whole picture, I guess, and, and each little step makes a difference. So, so thank you for that. Aaron, I've got one for you and we have had some people asking about families, carers, friends, partners, so all the people in, in the networks around individuals. How can all of those people 
play a role in helping the person with borderline personality disorder to um, to get better or to, um, to sort of get through some difficult times, perhaps. There are a few strategies you can try. Um, as with BPD, things are sometimes more receptive than other other methods, um, and it's just a matter of persistence, as I was talking about earlier. Um, one of the first things you can do is validate what your loved one or or um, associate um, may be feeling, that's in is it recognising that what they're feeling is an issue and um, helping them get through that emotion. Um, that This is achieved usually by taking a non-judgmental stance. So you wouldn't criticise or, or dismiss a person's feelings with BPD. Um, as you wouldn't say, oh, that's silly, get over it, or you shouldn't be feeling that, why can't you just snap out of it? That snap out of it mentality generally makes things worse. Um, so if you can try to use strategies that are not blaming, sometimes distracting can really help. So if a, you can see a, a person with BPD is getting agitated, you can always try and distract them by going for a walk or um, playing some music or learning an instrument. Um, there's all sorts of different ways and techniques you can try to do, but you have to be prepared yourself to try, try with them. Because if you can do that and they can reflect on that you're trying to give them a go um, and trying to get them through their emotions, um, that can help. So it's just generally a supportive role. Um, it does take a long time to recover from BPD. Not always, but with some it can take uh, quite a while. So it's just persistence and to keep trying. Um, you can use try and use examples of others with BPD who might be doing well um, in the sense that you can show them that you can recover from that. That may help as well. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. That's, that's really helpful. And I, I guess it's walking beside, I guess, and, and individualising it because each person is, is obviously an individual and at different times different things might work. So it, it sounds like there's a whole lot of, again, quite simple things that, that might be helpful that, that people can, can do together and, and sort of form a partnership with, with the person. I imagine it's quite important that um, families in particular might get some help for themselves as well. Is that something that you'd be, in terms of sort of thinking about how do you support the person, is that something that comes up? Ex yeah, it, you need to be able to take time for yourself mm. as well because sometimes BPD behaviours can be very draining and very intensive. Yeah. If you don't take time with yourself, just as a clinician would, if they spent and invested all their time with a person with BPD, they'd probably burn out eventually um, and not be able to do any further work. So yeah. it's really important that you take time for yourselves and don't criticise yourselves if sometimes you get angry or say things that you shouldn't. Um, that's really important um, mm. because like a person with BPD, we're all human, we all make mistakes. Um, sometimes people with BPD make a lot more mistakes than others. I know I certainly did. And I think it's important to to look at yourself and say, I'm doing the best I can, I'm trying, I'm still here, I'm still trying to support this person with BPD. Yeah, great, thank you. That's really important, I think, for, for people working because, of course, some people who are listening tonight might be working with family members as well and, and think about how do I how do I support them. And, and again, the psychoeducation sounds like it's really important for, for everybody to really understand what's, what's going on. So thank you. Moving back to you again, Safia, we've got a question around GPs and whenever I, I um, facilitate these MHPN webinars, this question always comes up about GPs and I know we've had lots of um, GPs who have registered um, for tonight as well and hopefully are, are here with us in the, I think there's about 1,500 people who are live with us tonight now. Um, so GPs, they're, they're very time pressured, they have short, short time with, with clients, with patients, so how can GPs work with a person with borderline personality disorder given all of those time pressures that they have? What can they do? Uh, the, the, the treatment principles that we um, discussed today are particularly uh, relevant for uh, general practitioners. Uh, let me try and see if I can put myself uh, in a GP's uh, shoe. Um, GPs are time poor. So first, first uh, we would want to be able to uh, recognize borderline personality disorder. One of the easier way of uh, recognizing would be to give a questionnaire. There are some screening tools uh, such as uh, VAN BPD uh, rating scale 
or a McLean uh, rating scale. So these rating scales uh, can be given to patients and uh, it's about eight questions, uh, the patients answer yes or no, and uh, eight to 10 questions, if they come into the clinic uh, from the waiting room uh, after having filled the questionnaire, uh, the GPs would be able to recognize uh, uh, whether these people have a, a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder or not. At least have a form a reasonable doubt. If they don't believe that they have a borderline personality disorder, they can refer uh, these patients to a psychiatrist for a one-off consultation to confirm the diagnosis where it is possible. Once BPD is established, it is important to also look at any other co-occurring disorders. Uh, depression can be can commonly co-occur with BPD. Uh, eating disorders can co-occur with BPD. Uh, drug and alcohol problems can co-occur with BPD. So it's important to recognize the uh, co-existing uh, disorders. Once and treat them accordingly. Uh, if it is depression, treat them with antidepressants. Recognize that uh, there is no medication for a bodily personal disorder. Uh, we need to teach them uh, skills. It's important to uh, validate and uh, uh, you know, uh, reassure patients and educate them as uh, Teresa and uh, Aaron were uh, uh, telling us earlier on. Also educate uh, their families. In fact, all the treatment principles uh, that, have been, uh, uh, that we have been outlining today are the ones which uh, we are expecting the GPs might be willing to give it a go. Uh, of course, they only have 10 minutes. So uh, five to ten minutes or fifteen minutes maximum uh, in their uh, consultations. So even in in each consultation, if they can make a small difference, uh, teach them one treatment principle each time. And if patients uh, self injure and come to the clinic, uh, again take a non-judgmental approach. Uh, just attend to the uh, medical needs of the uh, uh, person, and just ask uh, why did you cut yourself or why did you burn yourself? And the patient says uh, because I was feeling. Uh, you know, painful emotions, validate them, and try and see, if time permits, try and unpack a little bit uh, as to what may, what could have been the chain of events that led to them cutting. Commonly, not always, commonly the interpersonal uh, triggers are the ones which tend to lead to uh, uh, self-harm uh, behaviors. So that's one way of uh, managing. Also, to be able to recognize uh, when patients could be at a higher risk or, uh, or a danger to themselves. Usually this happens if, you know, uh, there's a pattern of uh, self-harm behavior uh, patients. Uh, rather than let's say that cutting is a normal self-harm behavior. And suddenly if a person is talking about something more serious, if they talk about, you know, I want to hang myself or I want to take care of a massive overdose. So this is something out of a pattern. If it is out of the pattern and if it is a very high lethal uh, cell form they're talking about, so that's the time to recognize that probably uh, these patients are at a more immediate danger. Then uh, you might have to uh, give them more intense support. They might want to ask them to come tomorrow. Or if they're dangerous imminent, of course, you need to call an ambulance and uh, encourage patients to seek hospitalization for a uh, short periods of time. Uh, also to recognize that... Uh, uh, the, the access to uh, specialist treatments uh, is very limited. Also, we have an entire generation of clinicians who are not uh, trained in the treatment of uh, borderline personality disorder. So therefore, the GPs might struggle to find uh, people to refer to. Also, some of the uh, 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 mental health clinicians might uh, have a bit of stigma around uh, borderline personality disorder and might uh, I'll be willing to uh, uh, treat them and uh, might, in fact, refuse to treat them. So uh, they, it, is, it may be possible to find uh, some clinicians who are willing to treat. At Spectrum, we do uh, try and uh, keep a list of people who do uh, who are willing to uh, treat people with body personality disorder, and we're happy to hand out that information to uh, GPs if they do give us a ring. Of course, that is relevant only for Victoria. Thank Great. You. Thanks. Thanks, Sophia. Now, I'm, I said we had some extra time, but our time is really going very, very quickly. And I know that people have got lots of questions that we haven't got to. We will have a look at the questions that um, we haven't got to tonight, and we'll look at how we can build them into the next next four 
series in the series webinars. So I'm very pleased we've got four more because I know it's it's a big topic and there's there's lots and lots of questions coming through. It is important though that we do have some take home messages. You've heard a lot of information and I think it is really important that we that we do start to um, wrap up and start to think about what are some of the what are some of the take home messages that are important for for you to to go away with? And I'll kick off with you. I think Teresa, what sort of messages would you want us to to go away with tonight? Well, always bring hope to your therapeutic table. So not sure a relationship that heals, because most clients with BPD have wounds and scars to the soul, and scars to the soul can take a very long time to heal. So there will be times in your therapy when you're dealing with a regressed, vulnerable and needy child. There will be times when you have a willful adolescent. There will be times when you're dealing with a very critical adult. Our job in the, in the business of human suffering is to foster a healthy adult that operates from an integrated, rational and emotive mind. Finally, your hopeful message is that, you know, it is never too late to develop a happy childhood. Teach them to be their own parent, to adopt a vulnerable child and give that child a, a, the, the support to develop a life that is worth living for them. So I would say bring hope to the client that they can become better. They can rediscover their full potential by recovering and work with them to acknowledge that self is a continuous work in progress and they can, with the appropriate help and relationship building, develop a life that's worth living for them. And I hope you as clinicians and healthcare professionals who have tuned in tonight, I thank you for your dedication in this arena and I hope and wish you all the best for working with this very worthwhile client group. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and it's a pity we couldn't see you as you were sharing those thoughts, but we certainly appreciate the images that you provided because I think they're, they're lovely for us to, to take away with. So, so thank you, and, and um, you're passionate about this work, and it's great that you can feel like there are a lot of other people that are out there wanting to join, join with you in, in doing this, so, so thank you. Aaron, let's move on to you. What would be your take-home message for people tonight? Thanks, Lynn. I think um, being patient yet persistent with a person with BPD is really important. Um, understand that everyone's human and everyone makes mistakes. Um, as to the extent of those mistakes, it can be difficult and tricky to manage. But if you show that you're consistently supportive towards a person with BPD, even though they may not appreciate it at the time, they will in the long run. I know I certainly did when I look back at my interactions with my mum and my dad. We used to argue a lot. I've also got a brother and sister. So if you can try and get along um, and try the best you can to, to sort through problems and take each day at a time rather than focus, focusing on past behaviours, as it does nothing as you, you're in the here and now. So I think um, providing support and validation particularly is really important, but also showing them that it is possible to take responsibility for yourself and to manage behaviours and there is a way you can do that. Fantastic. Thank you. Very helpful messages as well and I, and I guess hearing, hearing from you and, and obviously you know, the support that you've, you've received from people and, and but your own um, commitment to um, improving and, and going about what you, what you can do is, is really evident. So really hearing that and seeing that, which is, which is fabulous. So thank, thank you very much for those messages and for, for being here with us because I think it has certainly brought, brought a, a dimension that, that is so important and that we, we need to hear. So, so thank you, Aaron. And Safia, just the last word to you. What would be your take home message for tonight? Out of all the messages we've heard and shared tonight, what would be the main one for you? Uh, the main one is that uh, um, so treatment of borderline personality disorder is not rocket science. Every clinician can contribute in some way to the recovery journey of people with borderline personality disorder. Remember the technology of Carl I gave you. The clinicians are like driving instructors. So you need to share the risk along with the patient, sit alongside, ride the same car, 
and be compassionate, be kind, and keep teaching the person how to drive such a car with hypersensitive accelerators and uh, poor brakes. For that matter, anyone who is going to be a co-traveler uh, in that car can contribute uh, to bringing about uh, changes and teaching uh, skills uh, for the person who is driving. As uh, one of the scientists uh, in our field uh, put it, any reasonable treatment provided by reasonable clinicians in a reasonable manner may be beneficial to persons with bodily impulse disorder. So if you understand and validate them without judgment or without preconceived uh, notions and teach them skills to manage their feelings and relationships and intense thoughts, uh, fears, etc., they get better. Um, so as Aaron put it, we all make mistakes and uh, we are all uh, human. Uh, we can only give it a go. I would welcome uh, all clinicians to give it a go. And trust me, uh, the job satisfaction is great. And uh, once you start working with people with borderline personality disorder, you realize that they are some of the nicest people and they get better and they remain better. So it is hugely rewarding work. Give it a go. Thank you, Sathya. So give it a go is, is the take home message. And, and I guess to help people to, to maybe feel a bit more confident with that, we do have some resources and further reading, a really comprehensive um, list of resources and, and things we look at. There's, um, there's a whole range of different reading materials for you to, to look at and, and to build that confidence. And I guess, you know, we're always, I guess, encouraging people to work within scope and to be, be you know, cautious. But um, we, we also need to, I guess, be cautiously approaching this work and, and, um, and give it a go, as, as Safia has, has um, eloquently put it. I guess the other sort of message that I hear, and I heard this last time when we had our first webinar, and, and again tonight, is this message of hope and, and really challenging ideas that, that it's, it's hopeless and that, that there's no, no chance of recovery. So I, th I think the message of hope is coming through really, really strongly tonight, and, and I think that's a really important um, message for us to have as well if we're working with, with people who are, who are going through distressing times for us as practitioners to be, be hopeful and to... Um, hear stories of recovery and to know that it can happen and that we can play a part in that, um, that that's a really important message I think and, and for families to hear that as well and, and friends and, and people supporting um, people too is really important. Um, MHPN has a range of um, practitioner networks as well which is another source of support. So we're not saying go out and do all this without any support, we're saying there are resources there, there are other people who will be wanting to, wanting to have a go. So there are networking opportunities that, that are a really important part of um, MHPN's work and they support the ongoing the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks. So this is what we've seen tonight in terms of different um, perspectives, different disciplines coming together um, and in these networks um, people meet together regularly and they share tips and resources, they build local referral pathways, so we've heard a little bit about that, who are the people that are out there that you can refer to and engage in CPD activity. So obviously that's an important part of, of giving it a go is to, is to do this, this sort of support alongside that. So you can find out about your local practitioner network by contacting MHPN and BPD networks are also being developed. So if you have an interest in that, if this is an area that you're thinking I really would like to get more involved and I'm now starting to see that I can play a role, that I, I want people beside me to do that, well you can contact MHPN or go to the news section of the website. Um, we also have an exit survey that should be popping up. You can also put your interest in there. So we would like you to fill out the survey. It's a really important part of, part of the work and part of the development of these webinars and particularly because we've got four more, we want to make them as useful to you as possible. And also the government who fund us are always interested in what, what you've got to say. So please fill out um, the survey and um, add any comments in there. It's really important. Thank you for your participation tonight. Thank you for Redback for getting getting us back online after we had our little technical um, drop out and thank you everyone for persevering with that as well. You can see there that um, certificates of attendance will be issued within the next four weeks. You will get a link to the online resources that come with the webinar within the next couple of weeks as well. So there's lots of support for you to, um, to really do this work and, and do it in a way that, that fits with, with who you are and what, what your practice enables you to do. 
So before I close, I'd like to acknowledge consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you very much again to our panellists for um, your input and the planning that goes into these, these webinars beforehand and sharing so much information that there's, there's a lot of, lot of ideas I'm sure that people have got, got to um, go away with. We know there's a lot of questions you have, so please come back next time. And that will be sometime in April. We'll let you know through the usual channels. And we hope that you can join us again. So thank you very much and good evening. <laughs>